Fantasy XII was a game that I personally did not play until I played it at my neighbor's house back in 2007. Its concepts didn't really click with me, since the only other Final Fantasy games I had at the time that I had completed were Final Fantasy X, X2, and Dirge of Cerberus. Ironically enough, I thought that Final Fantasy X2 was actually Final Fantasy XII for the longest time because the Roman numerals were a concept that eluded my grasp. I remember not really liking Final Fantasy XII as much either because everything seemed too open for my liking, as back then I was more used to linearly structured games rather than completely open-ended games as Final Fantasy XII was. How ironic then that I can now say that as of 2020, Final Fantasy XII and its remake, The Zodiac Age, are my favorite numbered entries of the Final Fantasy series. So what changed from my initial play throughout my neighbor's house? Well, flash forward from 2007 to 2010, and I finally grabbed the game for myself and played it from the beginning and took time to learn the mechanics. I would then import the International Zodiac Job System version of the game from Japan in 2011, and that version fixed many of the gripes I had with the original vanilla version of Final Fantasy XII that I ended up falling in love with it. Story-wise, I love Final Fantasy XII despite all of its variations, but gameplay-wise, I guess I can say I can really only love the International and Zodiac Age versions, as I doubt I will ever go back to vanilla Final Fantasy XII again. The gameplay tweaks, balances, and additions in those versions just make them the de facto best versions of Final Fantasy XII, and unlike, say, Sonic Adventure on the Sega Dreamcast, which has merits to being played over the DX version for some, Final Fantasy XII's vanilla game has no real merits to being played over the International or Zodiac Age versions, I find. But, for some background on Final Fantasy XII, the game was created and developed by Square Enix, initially announced in 2004 at E3 2004 to be released for 2005 for the PlayStation 2. Only, the game was delayed into 2006, marking it to being one of the tail-end 6th generation games released for the PlayStation 2 by a major company. Originally directed by Yasumi Matsuno, the director of Final Fantasy Tactics, Vagrant Stories, the Tactics Ogres game, and the Tactics Advance games, Matsuno would have Final Fantasy XII set in the already established world of Ivalice rather than its own separate world created specifically for that game, unlike most other Final Fantasy games that had been before it. Matsuno would leave development of Final Fantasy XII around halfway through and would be replaced with Final Fantasy series veteran and battle planner Hiroyuki Ito. The game was released in early 2006 initially to high praise from Japanese consumers and critical acclaim in the West from many review outlets, but mixed to many fans in the West. A year later, in August 2007, the International Zodiac Job System was released to Japanese audiences and would fix many of the problems the original vanilla game had, as well as adding a job class system like classic Final Fantasy games. It would be this version of Final Fantasy XII that the later HD Zodiac Age port would be based off of, and would be released worldwide in 2017, initially for the PlayStation 4 exclusively, and while later versions of the Windows, PC, Switch, and Xbox One versions were released, more tweaks were added into Zodiac Age that only until a few months ago would be patched to make all versions of the game somewhat equal. Story talk will be applicable across all versions of Final Fantasy XII, since no additional story changes were made in the Zodiac Age, unlike how games such as Kingdom Hearts Final Mix series tend to do. And many of the things inside of this review that will be shown originate from the Xbox One version of the game played on an Xbox One X, which is the only version of the game on consoles that can play at 60 frames per second. So, as a result, there are going to be quite a few story things, and I will try not to get into spoilers too much for Final Fantasy XII, but some things just can't be helped. So, why don't we go through a quick synopsis of the story and see how it weaves the narrative of Ivalice together in Final Fantasy XII. Now, Sumi Matsuno's original scenario for Final Fantasy XII was pretty much mostly used for the final version of the game. Heavily inspired by the original Star Wars trilogy, episodes 4, 5, and 6 respectively, Matsuno crafted the world of Ivalice as being on the brink of world war between two massive empires, the Empire of Arcades to the north and Rosaria to the south, with smaller kingdoms such as the initial setting of Dalmasca and the Kingdom of Nebradia 
being caught in between the two empires. After the Arcadian Empire swallows up Dalmasca's neighboring kingdom of Nebradia, a treaty between Dalmasca and Arcades, King Ramanus and King Ramus is set to be signed. From there, we take control of our first character of the game, Rex, who is part of a squad that is set to protect King Ramanus when it turns out that the Arcadian Empire had set up this treaty meeting at Nebradia in order to kill King Ramanus and take full control over Dalmasca. After being supposedly betrayed by his captain, Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmasca, King Ramanus was slain, and thus Rex was returned to Dalmasca as a traitor and later dies from a combination of wounds from battle and a broken spirit. From there, time passes and we take control of Bond, Rex's younger brother who acts as the main character of the story, but not as the main character at the same time. See, Bond is a character that the main story does not revolve around, but a character that the main story happens around them. Through Vaughn, we are able to see the actions and the events that play out through Final Fantasy XII, while not really having his input too often within the game. As a result, this has led to a common misconception that even I believed for the longest time, in that Vaughn and his friend Pinello were added into the story late into development, which is why they don't have much interactions with the rest of the characters or story events. However, it turns out that's not the case, as Vaughn and Pinello were intended to be part of the story from the beginning, although their personalities and characteristics were changed throughout the course of development to better match more tropes that many of the fans of Final Fantasy in Japan would be appealing to at the time. In the background, while the player controls Vaughn throughout the Dalmascan capital of Ravanaster, Vaughn eventually hatches a plan to break into the royal palace during a fate to honor the new Dalmascan consul, Vane Solidor, one of the Arcadian Empire's crown princes. During the fate as well, in the background, a resistance group led by the former Dalmascan princess, Ash, going by Amalia at this time, plans also to sneak into the palace during the fate and slay Vane. Further in the background, two famous sky pirates by the name of Balthier and Fran also plan to sneak into the palace and claim the legendary treasure said to be hidden within for themselves. With all these events at play, the players are thrust into the overall forces and battles that end up ensuing, thus putting them on a path helping free the Kingdom of Dalmasca from the Arcadian Empire and stopping the Arcadian Empire from not only destroying the Kingdom of Dalmasca, but enslaving the entire world. So as you can see, there are a lot of Star Wars parallels to the story of Final Fantasy XII, and everything I just described pretty much happens in the first 40 minutes of the game. I don't really agree with the sentiment that some people throw at Final Fantasy XII, that it's basically ripping off Star Wars, because it does a lot of things on its own and in its very own unique ways, and at the same time, you have to remember, Yasumi Matsuno was highly inspired by the original Star Wars trilogy, so a lot of these parallels were on purpose to help the player and to help the audience realize, hey, I recognize this sort of story before. And hey, overall, if you're gonna end up copying a story format style, might as well go with one of the most successful franchises in history. Well, recent history. When it comes to the villains of the game, Vayne isn't really like past Final Fantasy villains as much. You see, Vayne's a lot calmer, he's more collected, he's more planning, he's a more of a military genius. As a result, you wonder why Vayne became this way, and you can get that through the context clues the game ends up giving you based on his upbringing. Was that Vayne was forced to put his own brothers to death by his father for betraying the Empire. We're never told what exactly this betrayal was. We're never told exactly what this effect had on Vane. Vane, therefore, as an overall antagonistic force, is present throughout the story based on his strings, but is not one that actively acts himself until the end of the game. And that's something that I think, in a political intrigue story such as this, really pays attention and really helps out. I'm reminded of Emperor Palpatine back when he was a senator, for Naboo and how he manipulated the Republic into eventually giving him supreme power. Next, there's the character of Dr. Sid, which also marked the first time that the recurring Final Fantasy character of Sid had been in an active villain role. Because while Dr. Sid seems like a babbling mad scientist throughout most of the game, it ends up getting revealed that that's not entirely the case. Sid isn't babbling insanity. 
he's actually talking to somebody that we don't see because the way the game portrays itself, we won't see this individual until later. And as a result, Dr. Sid pairs well with Bane because they're both ruthless and clever in their own ways, but have different overt personalities that make them stand out, but also don't crush each other with their presence. They're very much a good collaborating force of antagonists together, one acting out, one pulling from the shadows. Finally, there's Gabron, Bosch von Ronsenberg's twin brother, who was the actual killer of King Romanos in the beginning of the game, who framed Bosch for the Empire to give them control. Gabronth is highly loyal to a fault, and over the course of the game, wishes to understand how his brother, Bosch, who seems to have lost everything more than once, goes on with his life and furthers himself, despite the fact that the more Gabronth follows what he believes is right, turns out to put him more and more in despair and put his honor at risk. It's these three antagonists as a whole that help make the story of Final Fantasy XII weave together so well with the rest of the main cast. As for the main characters themselves, their cutscenes of their interactions with each other always make for a good time and you can see over the course of the journey across Ivalice how it changes them and their motivations throughout the story. To use Vaughn as an example again, at the beginning of the story, he is portrayed as an overt, annoying, naive child who really doesn't know about the world around him, but by the end of the venture he comes into his own and has matured into the sky pirate he's always dreamed of being. Or Ash, the Princess of Dalmasca, a character who was blinded by revenge for most of the story, and I mean most of the story, only to see that she was being used and decides to fight for peace instead going forward. All the characters in Final Fantasy XII's story are portrayed as believable and evolve over the course of the story, which is something I love in games in general, and when it's a highly narrative game like this, it makes me care about the characters even more than I already did. While most of the story hits well for me, I cannot deny that the ending is rather rushed when dealing with certain elements of the story, and certain plot threads that I would have loved to be explored go unexplored, which is rather a shame. I do understand why some of these plot threads had not been explored though, and that was because Final Fantasy XII as a whole is already a very big game, and you don't want to have it feel too bloated with story elements for its own good, so perhaps it was probably for the best. Not to mention, there are other games in what is known as the Ivalice Alliance that explore more into the world of Ivalice and explain more about how the world works and the gods in general. So, while Final Fantasy XII has a story that not many people would like because of the overtly political nature of it rather than the hero saves the world sort of thing, I still think it's a rather interesting take for a Final Fantasy game. But while I would say the characters are interesting and worth playing to discover more about Final Fantasy XII for that alone, the story is a huge selling point for me, but sound direction and voice acting, I think really helps sew the world together rather well. So why don't we briefly touch on the aspect of Final Fantasy XII's music and voice acting before moving into the gameplay. Final Fantasy XII overall had made very interesting choices for the voice casts in the game. So part of the reason for this is due to the fact that the decision from the English localization team for Final Fantasy XII was to hire voice actors with theater experience and who could do flat readings of the script while also using different dialects of English to do a variation throughout the world of Ivalice as well as variation throughout the English language. And this is a decision I very much like because it shows how big the world is that even though you speak the same language, the end result could be different because of different dialects. It's an interesting choice and the use of method actors to bring this to life was a great decision. Unlike normal Final Fantasy games or even most games in general, even nowadays, top billing voice actors weren't used. Instead, you use just regular voice actors and method actors, and I think it worked out in Final Fantasy XII's favor, more or less. Overall, though, the voice acting for Final Fantasy XII is very well done, with 
even some top billing voice actors still being inside the game, one of my favorite ones being John DiMaggio voicing a returning Gilgamesh for an optional mission in the game, but while the voice acting is very good for the use of the method voice actors, what about the music? Well, music of Final Fantasy XII was handled by three composers, Hitoshi Sakimoto, Hayato Matsuo, and Masaharu Iwata, with a special song at the end of the game, Kiss Me Goodbye, being composed by the departing Final Fantasy series veteran composer Nobuo Uematsu. Most of the soundtrack's creation is attributed to Sakimoto, and Sakimoto would go on in interviews to say that he developed the song for Final Fantasy XII to go around the theme of Kiss Me Goodbye, while also not wanting to copy the style of Nobuo Uematsu that had been famed for in previous Final Fantasy games. The result? A varied soundtrack with very different musical instrumentations and themes that doesn't sound like Uematsu's music, but fits the world of Ivalice very nicely. The standout tracks for me in Final Fantasy XII are the Sky City of Bujerba, Yurit Village of the Viera, and the Battle for Freedom final boss theme. With the international version of the game, several new soundtracks were added into Final Fantasy XII to give areas and bosses that previously shared music with one another their own distinct tracks. Finally, the Zodiac Age added all the soundtracks that were recomposed and newly composed for the international version and would recompose them while giving the player the option to switch between the original game soundtrack and the newly recomposed tracks. And if you had special DLC for the game, you could also use a different orchestral soundtrack for the game as well, but only if you had that DLC. But with the sound and voices being covered to enhance the story of Final Fantasy XII, what about the gameplay? Well, gameplay is definitely a point of contention for some when it comes to Final Fantasy XII, but it's something that I believe complements the game as well as it could given the major focus on narrative in Final Fantasy XII as a whole. Alright, so gameplay for Final Fantasy XII is a mixed bag. It has a lot of different styles, a lot of different things to go over, so we're going to go over them somewhat in a bullet point order, so to speak. In terms of gameplay, Final Fantasy XII has major different styles, but also some things that are familiar from other ones. Gone is the active time battle system of previous Final Fantasies, such as IX, which Hiroyuki Ito had previously directed beforehand. Hiroyuki Ito was the battle planner for Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age, and instead, for Final Fantasy XII and The Zodiac Age as a whole, what was done was a more real-time combat experience. If I can compare it to anything, think of it as a proto-form of Xenoblade Chronicles, and how it is handled for the gameplay. So, first off though, there are some gameplay tweaks and gameplay things that we need to go over. The first of which is the license board system. Originally, in Final Fantasy XII, there was one license board shared between all characters. Killing enemies would get you a certain amount of license points that you can use to spend on the license board. For the license board, once you spent those points, you can gain abilities to use certain equipment, spells, or techniques. It's sort of like the sphere grid from Final Fantasy X, but in this instance you need to buy or find the spells, abilities, or equipment at shops or in treasure chests yourself, while also having to buy the license points to use them. So it was not very well received, and as a result the license board system was changed in Final Fantasy XII International to instead being split into 12 different boards each representing a zodiac sign and a job class like a classic Final Fantasy character that the player was stuck with throughout the entire game. But one more tweak came in the form of Zodiac Age, thus making Zodiac Age the definitive version of the game, in which you had the ability to dual job class, where after you reached a certain point in the story, you would be able to use two job boards at the same time. Any two boards you want, so long as it's not the same board that you already have. You could be a holy knight, you could be a white mage and a machinist. You could be a time battle mage and an uhlan. All of these would go together, and one other addition that was made into later versions of Zodiac Age was the ability to change the license board at any time you want through Clan Centurio, thus making it that Final Fantasy XII is an entirely customizable game. 
Only took them until the Zodiac Age to be able to do that, but it did come with some cost. The game was never balanced with the dual job classing in mind or the ability to change job classes at will in mind, and as a result, you can end up breaking Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age in two. But if you're like me and like doing things like that, then this is all more of a plus to you. Next is probably the biggest point of contention that many people hold against Final Fantasy XII, and that is the Gambit system. A system that allows the player to set up certain commands to be auto-conducted by the character that they are set for, so then the player doesn't need to micromanage every aspect of battle. Things as simple as when my health gets lower than 60%, cast a healing spell. When my character doesn't have a scan ability, cast Libra. Things such as that. The biggest criticism thrown at the Gambit system, though, is that the game ends up playing itself as a result. And while that is true to a degree, the Gambits can be turned off and or ignored by the player if the player so wishes. Furthermore, in Zodiac Age and in the international version, you can turn off the Gambits of guest party members as well as turn off the Gambits of summons, so then you don't have to worry about your summons or guest party members screwing you over. I can't tell you how many times that happened to me in the original Final Fantasy XII. But also added into Zodiac Age was the ability for players to set up multiple types of Gambit. Overall though, relying on Gambits can help you with certain encounters, but with how enemies end up changing their battle planning and how enemies can end up changing overall throughout the course of the battle, you can't always rely on the same Gambit setup for every encounter. Because next thing you know, you're healing an enemy that you didn't mean to heal, and then you're in a whole world of trouble. Also changed from Final Fantasy X was how encounters are handled. See, Final Fantasy XII does not do random battles like previous Final Fantasy games, and instead opts for an open world where the enemies are visible and are on screen already, and the player therefore has to choose whether to battle that foe or not. You can always tell which enemy is going to be stronger than you based on the color of their name or based on if you have a scan ability, such as Libra, if they are stronger than you and if they are going to wreck your ever living shit. The omission of random battles is something I greatly appreciate, as one thing that really annoyed me in Final Fantasy X was how frequent random battles were in the game. And if you didn't have a no encounter ability item equipped, then it was ridiculous. Now, another change from Final Fantasy X is how the party level and how the party are structured. See, you have regular levels in the game, like always, but you can only have three party members at a time, usually sometimes with a fourth guest party member out on the field as well. You can end up switching out all party members except for one whenever you so wish, and that player will get more experience for that character but it comes at the risk of if that character dies, you have to revive them and bring another character out to battle. Luckily, unlike Final Fantasy X though, where if you end up losing all three of your party members inside of a battle, you don't instantly game over. The game doesn't turn to game over until all your playable characters are defeated. So you can go in the middle of battle and you can end up changing out characters whenever you want, so long as they're not being targeted. This is very helpful in staying alive and is one thing I really didn't like about Final Fantasy X when three of my characters died and I have three more in reserve but I can't use them because the three characters' bodies are on the floor in the first place. Then there's the different types of attacks in the game. For regular attacks, we have physical attacks, magic attacks, which are separated into different classes of magic, and techniques as well as the mist commands. For physical attacks, there's a wide variety of weapons in the game with each weapon being attributed to certain classes for the Zodiac Age and international versions of the game. You have rods, poles, lances, guns, swords, great swords, ninja swords, daggers, hand bombs, spears, bows, crossbows, scales, measures, maces, axes, and a whole wide variety of more. You also have shields, heavy armors, light armors, mystic armors, the list goes on. For magics, you have white magic for healing, black magic for offensive spells, time or green magic for buffs and debuffs, and arcane magic for dark magics. Techniques range from something simple like steel, to being able to cast a random black magic spell or hit flying enemies with ground weapons. Finally, we have the mist commands, which have two categories, 
Quickenings, which are super moves specific to each character with three tiers that can be purchased in the license board. Or Espers, which are summons unlocked through the license board after defeating an Esper in battle. For Espers, only one character may obtain that Esper on the license board, and they often lead in the Zodiac Age and inside of the international version to floating island paths on the license board, which could be used to get more unique classes, spells, or items for that class that they normally cannot obtain. It's always beneficial to look at all characters on a license board to see which one's the best fit for an Esper. Espers and Quickenings can also change the tides of battle, but I will admit I never use them. The Miss Command is something I rarely ever use unless I'm going for specific achievements or hope to cheese a boss I really don't want to deal with. In the original Final Fantasy XII, Miss Commands were tied to one's MP bar, which made this a whole lot more detrimental and dangerous if a player decided to use a Quickening or a Summon and it didn't kill the enemy in question, because now you'd be out of MP and you have no way of casting spells or you have no way of ending up casting more quickenings or summons until your magic meter fully fills back up. But as of Zodiac Age and the international version, a separate bar was made for quickenings and summons to make it easier for the player to have access to magic. So once you use a quickening or summon, you can just end up waiting for that bar to recharge. Usually it recharges by dealing damage to an enemy and then you can use the missed commands again while still using your regular magic, something that is greatly appreciated and something I don't understand why was not in the original. You know what else was not in the original game? The damage limit. You see, in Final Fantasy XII, a lot of enemies have a lot of health. I'm looking at you, Yasmat, with your 50 million HP. In the original Final Fantasy XII, there was a damage limit to how much damage a character could do, that damage being 9,999. This is terrible for vanilla Final Fantasy XII because enemies gain tens of thousands to later millions of HP for certain specific bosses. And the fact that you could only do 9,999 damage with no way of breaking the limit was horrible. Not even summons could break the limit. This was changed inside of Final Fantasy XII International and the Zodiac Age to having no damage limit. Again, this is something that Final Fantasy International fix and thus the Zodiac Age fix, but why was it a problem in the first place? Because Final Fantasy X did not have this problem. Overall though, the gameplay for Final Fantasy XII is mixed in with offline MMO elements, which given how successful Final Fantasy XI was, makes sense that Final Fantasy XII would go through that and experiment with something similar to Fantasy Star Online. Combine the gameplay with explorable and populated cities containing many different side quests, hunting side quests that you take on certain rogue and special monsters, and a bestiary that can be filled up to give the player more history of the world around them. And you've got a game that completing 100% can be daunting and will take you a while. Heck. For my playthrough on my channel, Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age has become the longest playthrough in my entire Let's Play history and has taken me over 100 hours to complete. And even then, I don't fully have 100, true 100% because I don't have every single one of the weapons. My license boards are filled out, I have all summons, I have all achievements, and if I were playing on the PlayStation 4 version, I'd have the Platinum Trophy. But I don't have true 100%. And I don't feel like going for that because some of the spawn rates are abysmal in Final Fantasy XII. Final Fantasy XII is a game that I have seen go from being railed against online constantly, despite the critical acclaim from many different news outlets, to being well loved by many people. It's kind of strange, actually. I myself went through not liking the game for the longest time to it being my favorite numbered Final Fantasy game as a whole. While many don't like the overtly political nature of Final Fantasy XII, I say it's a rather interesting story given the history of Ivalice and given what other Ivalice Alliance games would end up exploring upon. The music, vocal performances, and mechanics are all interesting and something that I absolutely love to play every couple of years. Given that the Let's Play I did was super in depth though, I find that Final Fantasy XII is more of a game that I play once or twice a decade 
rather than yearly or every two years because of how big the game is. So for you, just know that this could be a one and done game and that's all you really need. So if you want to try a different kind of Final Fantasy, I say give Final Fantasy XII the Zodiac Age a try. I gotta mention specifically, try the Zodiac Age. Do not go back to original vanilla Final Fantasy XII. It's definitely a game that will take some time, but it pays off in the end once you are finally able to say, I did it. I beat the game the way I wanted to beat it. But anyway, everyone, I'm gonna end it off right here. This has been Neronium. And I thank you all for watching my review of Final Fantasy XII. See you all next time.